Well, welcome everybody. So good to see you here today on this wonderful, um, you know, back east we would, I would say an autumn day. It doesn't quite feel like autumn uh, for me, and Calif California autumn is a little different than the, uh, than the weather that I grew up with back in Maryland. Uh, my name is Reverend Alice Reed, and I am your senior minister here, and I'm really happy to be talking to you this month about this wonderful topic of power. October is also traditionally the month where we do our committed giving campaign, and this is an opportunity for you to invest in our community. And so we, we have this wonderful legacy of this center that has been so supported by its members for so many years, and so our opportunity this year is to continue that legacy and to be part of that legacy as we, as we evolve as a community. There's a wonderful altar in the back where when you fill out a committed giving card, we, I will, if we don't already have your picture, we'll put your picture on the, on the wall and a star. That's supposed to represent the universe. And um, to our regular committed givers, if you, uh, I just want to, to ask you if you would consider giving us a little more bread, like increasing your uh, gift for, by 15% from last year. If you give us a little more bread, I'll bake you a loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that you can put in the uh, request for gluten-free or you could have a, a nice little a quick bread. I'm happy to bake bread for you because that's what we do here. We feed each other. We feed each other with love. We feed each other with wisdom. Um, there is a wonderful opportunity all the time and in so many different ways throughout the week for us to be fed by each other. The other th and speaking of being fed by each other, I am doing a class on Monday nights. It's brief. It's only an hour. You can be here in person or you can be online in Zoom. It's called Money Mastery, and it's really so much more than about money. It's really about consciousness. And so I, you know, I've been saying all month that contrary to popular opinion, uh, money is not power. It's your relationship to money that represents your relationship to power. So as you look, as we look at our relationship to money um, in this money mastery class, we begin to tap into real power, that power that lives within us. And that is the topic of this month's theme. We're talking about power. And, um, you know, we have this, this power to the people, which really is about how we can find and tap into our true power, the power that lives within. And so in week one, we talked about the... Um, the power that comes from within us, that that's where we really find true power. And then in week two, we talked about your personal use of that power. And this week, we're talking about power together. And I, and I love that because for me, that really represents community. It represents the, the power of a group of individuals that come together for a common purpose. And I really think that's true of this community. We come together for a common purpose. We have this idea that consciousness creates life and that we are, I would say, guardians of our own consciousness. And then we support each other in that, in that goal of uh, really minding our minds and being able to really walk out life from a place that's intentional. And, um, and imbued with a God quality. For me, that God quality is love. I want to reveal love everywhere I go. For you, it might be beauty or joy. But we, we talk about those things in, in our community gatherings like this. And so as we look at this idea of power and togetherness, um, I, I think of it as, and I, and I love this, rather than, you know, much of what we experience in the world is this power over energy, right? This 
what we need, we sometimes it's very innocent, just like you try to have more power over your life, right? Or you're trying to have more power over your finances, or you're trying to have more power over the condition, whatever conditions you're dealing with. But, but for me, what I understand when I become aligned and in right relationship with power, it's more of a power with the divine. And that's what we we uh, teach here, that's what we practice here, this power with the divine that lives within us that wants to be expressed by means of us. Now, I have a model for consciousness that I often share with you, and I love playing with it because it provides me with a great framework for how to look at different ideas. And so as we're looking at power this month, I thought that I would um, share with you my ideas about this Uh, kingdoms of consciousness and how it relates to power. Now, kingdoms of consciousness, if you're not familiar with that framework, what we know about consciousness is it's one thing. It's not like a bunch of things. It's one thing and then it expresses itself and individuates itself in many ways. And when we look at consciousness in this framework of kingdoms of consciousness, I think the curriculum that we work with is changing that verbiage because some people get a little triggered by, you know, bible kind of words. So <laughs> the word that uh, we're beginning to use is states of consciousness. Um, but for, for my purposes, because this is what I often use with you guys, I'm, I'm, we're talking about kingdoms. And so this, these four kingdoms are ways that we relate to the divine. The divine isn't chopped up into four different parts, but we relate to it at different levels. And so kingdom one is that kingdom to me, and that is the place where we see the power outside of us, right? It's a little bit victimy. It's a little bit of things happen um, to us where we don't feel like we have a, a, a sense of our own power. We... we Come to this teaching, if you're new to this philosophy, what will often happen is you begin to have a sense of personal responsibility and there's a little arrow that moves us up to kingdom two and while there's, um, there's no true hierarchy, that kingdom two really is that kingdom where we begin to feel a sense of responsibility and empowerment where we recognize that the power is in me, it is in you, it's in all of us and, and we are empowered by our very own good ideas and our good actions. They're the things that are meaningful to us and that often motivate us. And it's a great feeling to be in Kingdom 2 because you, you kind of get a sense of your own agency in life. Now, there's two sides to this framework. And, the, on, and on the left side, we have the Kingdom 1 and Kingdom 2. And on, on the right side, we have Kingdom 3 and Kingdom 4. Now, I know your left and my right are mixed because I'm facing you, but I think it's the same for you when you look at the chart. So, so the, the left side of this chart is really the chart that is more dualistic. There's something happening within me, and I see something happening within you, whether I feel like I'm a victim, and something's being done to me, or whether I feel empowered and I'm going to lift other people up. We're still in a dualistic relationship with the divine. But what we know about the divine is that it's not dualistic. It's unitive. And so there's this arrow that moves us from kingdom two to kingdom three to drop into this place of... um, kingdom of the power with that I talked about a little earlier. And that's really the kingdom that I want us to focus on today as we look at this, uh, this idea of power with and power together is this place where there is complete freedom. In kingdom two, I got to be large and in charge. It may not be your experience, but it certainly is mine. <laughs> I often feel like when I'm empowered and I have all this responsibility, like sometimes it can be a little heavy. Anybody else? (laughs) Yeah, be a little heavy. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I fall back into kingdom two all the time. One of the places that often gets stuck in kingdom two is fact-checking Facebook posts. Anybody else relate to this? (laughs) 
you know, there's something that comes up and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, that can't be true. <laughs> and then I go fact check it. Oh, and then it's up to me to share my facts with you. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. But in, and on some level, it's good to have a clear idea of what's true and, not, and what's not true, but on the other hand, it can get a little obsessive <laughs> for some of us. And so, uh, Kingdom 2 is a place where I can take sometimes too much responsibility. The thing I love about Kingdom 3 is that oftentimes that's the place I go when I completely surrender and I can come to a place of greater freedom. It's while I do have some responsibility in the choices that I make, I also know that I, it's not, I'm not just working here by myself. I'm not just out here on a limb. I'm working with the divine power that makes the grass grow and the, aligns the stars in the heavens. Like, I'm working with that power all the time. And so Kingdom 3 for me is this juicy place that I want to be in. And the tricky part is, like, it's, I, I can strive for being in Kingdom 3, but wait a minute, that sounds like Kingdom 2. <laughs> so so the, the point of Kingdom 3 is this deep surrender and trust, to trust the nature of the universe, to trust the power of the divine that is moving through our lives all the time and supporting us in our good ideas. The... The fun thing about the kingdoms is we move through them all, sometimes simultaneously. And so it isn't like first grade, second grade, third grade. <laughs> it would be nice, right? Because then we'd have a greater sense of control. Wait a minute, that kind of sounds like kingdom two. So, <laughs> so the idea here is to trust whatever is happening before us and surrender to it and not surrender to it in a kind of wimpy way. The, the thing I love about this model is <clears throat> Kingdom 1 and Kingdom 3 kind of have some things in common, right? The, in Kingdom 1, we, do, we have this sense where we have no power of our own and in Kingdom 3, we surrender the power completely, right? Just, but one is more unitive. One is more integrated with where we align ourselves to the divine idea of life. Now, I know because it's the human condition, you're all wanting to talk about Kingdom 4, and you're all wondering, oh, yeah, I've been in Kingdom 4 before. <laughs> because we, li we love that idea of being completely one with the divine. And what I want to say is that does happen, but my personal experience, and I could be, you know, it could just be me, but my personal experience is that I get hooked by my human condition. And so those, those beautiful moments of feeling completely unified with the divine, and I don't see an us and them, I don't see the dualistic nature of this, this human confines of our universe, when I can drop all of that away, it, there's just one thing. I don't know where it ends and where it begins. And sometimes I need some help <laughs> to, to remember that. And I forget all the time. We talked about that a little bit last week. I re I was, there was a reading I was doing. I remember and then I forget and then I remember and then I forget and then I remember and I forget. And that is our human condition. And so all of you that are either watching the broadcast or here in the room, you are here because you want to remember. You want to remember that divine spark that, that lives within you, that burns within you, whether you are aware of it or not. So this, this framework, for me, helps to remind me of where I want to place myself. And I haven't, I haven't looked at it in a while. And I've been really getting caught up with my task list and all the things that you know, this beautiful thing we call life is asking of me. There's, um, there's so many commitments. There's things that are important. There are things that need to be done right away. There's facts that need to be checked. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of things that will, in my experience, draw us out of that remembering. And so sometimes we need some help remembering. 
And there's, um, you know, I was thinking about it this morning, and there are a couple of mystics that remind me about this beautiful place in Kingdom 3 where I feel freedom and surrender, and I'm not trying to save the world. And that um, one of those is Richard Rohr, who I often bring before you. He seems to always know what to say and what I need to hear. And, and he sends out a daily email. And this week was no different. He um, talked about, and I'll just read of this a little bit of context for you and then the part I want to read. But he talks about the, today's information overload where w people are looking for certitudes so that they can sort of gauge themselves in this world that is changing and busy and seems to be in danger of falling off the, you know, uh, rotation of the, you know, out of this galaxy, if you will. I know that's a little dramatic, but <laughs> um, oftentimes there's a lot going on and it can feel overwhelming. And, um, and I'm pretty sure all of us have had that experience. And so he's, he's just talking about how we're always trying to find that grounded place where we can feel safe, where we can know something. And, and oftentimes we reach for some kind of Kingdom 2 experience. But it's really in the Kingdom 3 experience that we're going to have true grounding. And so he writes, Great spirituality, on the other hand, is always seeking a very subtle but creative balance between opposites. When we go to one side or the other too much, we find ourselves either overly righteous or overly skeptical and cynical. There's that fact-checking business. There must be a healthy middle as we try to hold both the needed light and the necessary darkness. He goes on to talk about the importance of a humble and honest process for learning to listen within ourselves, to learn to listen to that deep voice within us that is sometimes so subtle and sometimes gets drowned out by all the distractions that are around us. He finishes up by saying, faith isn't supposed to be a top-down affair, but an organic meeting between an inner knower accessed by prayer and experienced and the outer knower, which we would call holy writings and tradition. This is a calm and wonderfully healing way to know full reality with a capital R to know full reality, to have that balance between our inner knowing and our outer knowing. And then he quotes Adam Bucko, who is an author, an interesting guy, look him up, and he talks about contemplation as being that place of receptivity where we can wrestle with questions like, what breaks your heart? I love that. What breaks your heart? A and why do I love that? Because my heart, and I imagine you're like me, oftentimes stands guard. And sometimes I need a little heartbreak so that I can let in the love and the light and the truth. And I can let out a little of the darkness that I might be carrying. And so this idea of power together and power with, when we can center ourselves in that, we can begin to walk it out in a really powerful way as community. And so the, the last, well, no, there's one other thing I wanted to share with you before I read from, from my um, favorite author. And that is that when things are spinning and feeling a little bit out of sorts, there's a wonderful practice you can do. And so I'm going to invite you to do it right now. And that is to simply fold your hands over your arms like this and gently tap yourself. It grounds you in the here and now. You feel the skin on your arms and the fingers touching you to, to know that there's something concrete happening right now because sometimes we can really get lost in our mind. And so that's just a somatic little touchstone. The other thing you can do is look around the room and pick a color and then look for that color everywhere you see it. And that also grounds us and brings us to the here and now because as they say in the recovery program, if I have one foot in yesterday 
and another foot in tomorrow, well, I'm messing up today. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm messing up today. Um, yeah, and so our job as religious scientists, as spiritual finders, not just spiritual seekers, but spiritual, spiritual finders, is to stay in the present moment and be in the moment with each other because that's the, the center point of our power together when we can be centered and with each other. And so I was guided to pick up my copy of Wild Mercy. This is a book by Mirabai Starr, and she's one of my favorite authors. If you don't know about Mirabai Starr, she is a Jewish Christian... No, she's a Jewish hippie chick who translates 15th century Christian mystics. She's, so she likes to refer to herself as interspiritual. And so she has a whole chapter in, these are, these are like little essays, and she has a whole chapter in here on um, community building and connecting. And so I'll read a little piece of this to you. And we'll wrap it up with this. Participating in the human condition can be bewildering. It is just not always cozy and easy. Rather, it's humbling at best downright humiliating when it's not flowing. It can seem so much simpler to ride solo, slaying your own dragons and singing the ballads you wrote about yourself. Collaboration can be tedious, and the prevailing masculine value system may have you conditioned to feel like you are giving away your power when really what you're doing is sharing it with others. So what, she says, give it away. The time of the singular sage bestowing their unique wisdom is over. That was a method devised by individuals in charge who sought to regulate wisdom. They taught us to suffer alone in the desert of 40 years, collecting our insights in a secret box labeled esoteric knowledge. Then we were supposed to dispense those insights stingily to those who proved themselves worthy by also suffering alone for the requisite 40 years in the desert. And we don't have to suffer alone. That is not the call. The call is to connect with each other, to see each other, to, do you know that, you, I know you, have you had that experience when somebody really sees you? Right? That experience where somebody just really sees you? That is spirit-loving spirit. She goes on to say, our way, the way of the feminine, which applies to you too, guys, because we all have feminine and masculine energy. She says, our way, the way of the feminine, is to find out what everyone is good at and praise them for it and get them to teach it to one another. Maybe you know something about the hidden meetings of the Hebrew letters or how to build a sustainable home from recycled tires and rammed soil, or loving-kindness meditation. You, the one who knows the Islamic call to prayer, climb the minaret and call us all to prayer. You, the one who knows how to sit quietly at the bedside of the dying, show us the way to bear witness. You, the one who knows how to get us to wake up to the shadow of privilege, please wake us the freak up. It will be chaotic, all this community building, but your cooperation will save the world. And besides, it might just be fun. So we have an opportunity to, to move through the week looking for opportunities to see each other, to connect, to recognize that power within in that, and that power with that is moving through us is that opportunity for us to experience God in our relationships with each other and in community. And so as you move through this week, I invite you to maybe pause when you're ready to judge and pause when maybe something makes you angry or pause when you see something that looks completely opposite of who you think you are. And in that moment, maybe even do a little tapping to get yourself present and see if you can see the God and the power 
within that's right in front of you. Perhaps it's right in front of you in the mirror or in a relationship you're struggling with or in a condition that you're dealing with. But I can guarantee you when we pause and ground ourselves, that's where we find true power. Thank you very much. And so let's go ahead and tap into the power through prayer. And so join me in this affirmative mind treatment, this spiritual prayer. I invite you to close your eyes and go within. Taking a time out from all the distractions around you and know that there is a divine presence that lives within each one. It is the same presence that lives in you, that lives in any, everywhere else, in our, in our friends, in our family, in our perceived enemies. There is a presence of divine source that is expressing itself. So in this moment, I invite you to let go of your bias and to simply know that God is forever giving itself to life. God is forever giving itself to its creation. And so we recognize ourselves as the creation of the divine everywhere present. When we look in the mirror, when we feel our own body temples, when we see another beloved, when we see someone we don't understand, it is the beloved in form. There are no exceptions. So I know as we walk out this week in a time of great turbulence and discord, we choose over and over and over again to see the beloved everywhere we look. We pause. We let go of behaviors and choices that continue to separate us. And we look for opportunities to connect. For this is truly where our power resides in our connection with the divine and our connection with each other. It is like Indra's net where we are all connected at various points where we can never be separate. Where on this beautiful web in the universe we pull one string and we feel it on the other side of the universe. Yes, there is connection. And it is ours to be aware of. And so I know for each one and within the sound of my voice that we lean in and we embrace that connection and we see the beloved everywhere we look. It is a blessing to look at life with God's eyes and to feel life with God's heart and to speak words with God's wisdom, knowing that each one of us are those beautiful effects of that same divine wisdom and life force. Thank you, God. Thank you, life. Thank you, community. And we anchor this in that beautiful surrender by saying together, and so it is.